Well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I'm Brian Ledet. I'm an associate professor at SUNY ESF. Um, I'm here to talk about some of the work we've done over the last couple of years um, through TIBS with uh, Dr. John Farrell. But a lot of this work, well, all of this work, was done with two very good friends, Ben Gallo and Amanda Lemoyne. We're going to talk a little about the fish microbiome. Um, I'm going to tell you a story. First, it's going to start with uh, what's common between ticks, coffee, and fish. Well, this tells the start of the story. Um, for the past 17 years of my life, uh, I've been studying ticks and tick-borne diseases. Um, one day, John and I had coffee, and I didn't have a picture, so I had to put a terrible Photoshop up. Um, uh, but we talked about stuff, and uh, John found out that prior to me having kids, I love fishing. Um, so uh, we started discussing, um, looking at the microbiome in fish, and answering some questions in, the, in, the, in his system up in, up in the upper St. Lawrence River. So for this talk, I'm going to tell you the story of my uh, foray into the fisheries. Um, we're going to talk about the importance of the gut microbiome, factors that affect it in fish, uh, and patterns that we see in species and habitats, spawning at nursery site and trophic gills. And then lastly, we'll end with some really cool stuff on the artificial diet influence on microbiome development in the uh, in early gut. But first, I want to talk to a, a, a review that we wrote um, in fisheries. Uh, it kind of hides the idea that uh, we know a lot about the gut microbiome, from human studies, um, but fish make up 50% of the vertebrates. So um, it's really underexplored, um, and uh, uh, we, we want to look into that. And what's really interesting about the gut microbiome is it functions in this gut-brain access. And what we know from human studies is that it's really important. It, it, it influences a lot of, of, our, of our immunology uh, through interaction with the immune system, behavior through interactions with the central nervous system, endocrines, signaling. It is so complex and it affects every part of us throughout our lives. Happens in fish too, not surprisingly, and it's very complex like everything else. But when we look at fish, we can divide by looking at host, the host fish, and what really influences that are things like taxonomic position. We see differences in taxonomic gut microbiome and taxonomic position. Developmental stage, as the fish goes through autogeny and grows throughout its life. When we switch to the environment, environmental factors like geographical location of sampling, shows differences in gut microbiome, the habitat you take them from, and then on diet, huge, huge player here, um, that where they're getting their nutrient sources, plant versus, versus carnivore, um, what trophic level they fill in a system, and as you know better than I do, that can change depending on where they are and what congeners other species are there or invasion is going on, and then their feeding behavior, which can vary as well. So first I want to highlight this, uh, this work by Ben Gallo. Uh, we, I've never done microbiome, I've done a lot of next-gen sequencing. Um, so I said, let's try and figure out a nice method to do this and, uh, and a cheap method. So if you want to go into microbiome research, this paper is like a, a walkthrough, detailed lab methods, and we've got a pretty cheap assay going on here. And I said, let's see if we can detect really big differences, differences between species of fish and differences between the same species at different sites. So we looked at round goby and yellow bullhead um, at two different sites, a deep water profundal and a near shore um, with the round gobies. So throughout my talk, you're going to see a couple graphs. This is an NMDS plot, um, and what you need to take from it's kind of a PCA. The closer these are grouped, the more likely they are, and the farther they're apart, the less likely they are. Um, and here you can see our, we were able to deter, to see significant differences between round goby gut microbiome and yellow bullhead gut microbiome. Black round goby, red yellow bullhead. Great. Now when we looked at round goby between the two sites, the profundal versus the near shore, uh, the profundal site has this black circle, and they're really tight. And you'll see what, what's driving that. But they're significantly different than the near shore, which has a lot more variation in community structure. Now, when we look at the actual bacteria that are making up, the top bacteria making up, you're going to see a lot of bar graphs. And all you need to know is the y axis is the percent of the total community, the bacterial community. So if it's high percentage, this is a, you know, 75% of the bacterial community is the Aeronoinus in, in, in these round goby. Um, and then very different for the yellow bullhead. So they were different, driven by these community level differences. When we looked at round goby, you can see that um, in the profundal environment, it really was dominated by um, uh, Aeromona species. And then when we got near shore, there was a little more diversity. So that was really a, a, a great, and we can take this a technique and apply it to other questions. So one thing I've really been interested in is, if you know, if, 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 uh, in humans, if you're born via C-section or vaginal delivery, it really changes your gut microbiome. And so John and I were talking about whether we could uh, associate spawning site and gut microbiome with immigrated fish. And lucky for me, John's been doing this a long time, and they have an annual immigration study for northern pike. Um, so we published this in Aquatics and Fish and Fisheries. And we selected two creeks. Um, they're about 15 miles apart as the crow flies, a little further as the fish swims. 
But both are drowned, are river mouth wet, uh, wetlands. They were, we, we deployed hoot nets as part of the, uh, the Northern Pike Immigration Study for three weeks in, uh, in June. And we, we, we sampled juvenile Northern Pike coming out of these habitats. And what we found was that uh, uh, when we look at the gut bacterial community, this is the water column here, so we took water samples, and the water column is very different than what's in the gut of the fish. But between the two creeks, they were, the waters were very similar. We didn't expect much of a difference. And the fish were very similar between the two creeks, despite they were from different creeks. And they're like, well, that's not good. Not what we were looking for. But when we break it apart to actually looking at the bacteria that are there, uh, and I want to show you this, this is the bacteria that are dominating the water column in these colors. And those colors are very different than what's in the fish gut. Um, and that was interesting to us. Um, and you can see in the fish gut, uh, you have the cranberry where it's dominated by this uh, pseudobacteria. I'll, I'll break this apart a little further in the next slide. Um, but when we look into actually the uh, abundance of the water sample microbiota, um, you look at, these are the, the bacteria that are dominating the gut of the fish, and this is the abundance in the, in the water column. So less than a tenth, almost a tenth of a percent of the, 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 microbi the, the microbiota are dominating or are actually inoculating the gut of the fish. And what was really ex exciting is that we found in cranberry there was the Cetobacteria we really didn't uh, 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 detect in French Creek. So there was a, a specific constituent that made up a large portion of the cranberry creek fish. Now remember, these are fish that are immigrating. It could change later on, but this was just a start. So overall, gut microbiome looked the same, but some core constituents differ between habitats, but we thought that was really interesting. So we explored this a little more. We wondered about the environment driving a fish's core microbiome. And so Amanda, um, who just graduated and we're working on publishing this, um, decided to, to study fish in two different bay embayments, um, large embayments, coastal embayments around islands, uh, Eel Bay and Flynn Bay. They're about seven miles apart as the crow flies for, her, for fish. And she did hoop netting in, in June and August. Um, we ca she captured fish that were young of year, year one, um, and the species she focused on were uh, brown bullhead, uh, tadpole mad tom, uh, pumpkin seed and bluegill. So we've got two benthic feeders that are catfish and the two more what we will call opportunistic feeders that are sunfish. However, importantly enough, you know this, in this system, they, they occupy the same trophic level, so around three. So same trophic level, but very different feeding strategies. So when we looked at the, 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 between the locations, we didn't see any community level differences between fish at locations, which we didn't see with the, with the pipe either, so that was good. But when we started looking at um, uh, trophic yield, so dividing them into benthic or opportunistic, so the, the yellow is the benthic fish and the, the black are the opportunistic fish, we do see a difference. We do see a clustering difference. And this was a combining them between sites, and when we broke them apart to individual sites, that, 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 uh, that difference was, cons was, was there as well. So it was within site and between site differences based on their feeding um, habits. When we look at what was making up the gut microbiome and the benthic fish here, you can see it was dominated by this Clostridium sensu stricto, almost 55% of their gut microbiome was made up by that. And then the opportunistic fish was much more diverse, um, which may be a reflection of, of what they're feeding on. So that, uh, that was the dominant bacteria here, significantly higher, and these were the three more significantly uh, higher in the, uh, in the opportunistic. So it's kind of looking at diet may play a role. Um, so well, lucky for us, we have a great facility at Tibbs, an Aquarius system, and a student, uh, Ben Gallo, did a, a, an interesting experiment. It was a very interesting experiment. <laughs> had a lot of headaches during this experiment. Uh, but we just recently published this in Hydrobiologia. And we took northern pike um, eggs, and we, we, well, we uh, then took northern pike eggs, grew them up, and uh, when they were so up fry, well, we put them into an Aquarius set, a random Aquarius tank set up. Uh, we had three tanks uh, for each treatment group. Um, and what we did is uh, we decided to, uh, to sample for four weeks. So we took a zero week, we put them in three tanks, and we took three tanks and fed them natural zooplankton. Now I've been told that that's not a good strategy when you're trying to raise fish, um, because it's hard to get enough zooplankton to feed the fish. But it may be, may be really uh, important. And then we took three other tanks and we gave them artemia, and I've been told that makes fish fat and happy. John calls them jelly donuts. Um, but that may not be the best, the best thing for their gut. Um, so we sampled the fish at weeks one when they were on a zooplankton or artemia diet, at weeks two when they were on a zooplankton or artemia diet, and then at weeks, at week, prior to week three, we switched both to dry food. So it's a, it's a, it's a high protein fish food diet to use, um, and uh, followed them for two more weeks to see what was going to happen. And this is what we saw. So again, these are bar graphs, and just look at the color differences. That's important here, um, but, but the end results are really staggering. So these are the, the fish that did not have any food, and they had a really interesting gut microbiome that changed as soon as they started feeding. Not surprising. So this is what they inherited probably from, their, from, from the mother. 
Um, and the zooplankton up top, your team around the bottom. Um, Aeromonas was very common in Luciana, it's a very common thing to see in fish, but there's a lot more diversity in the, uh, in the, um, in the artemia fed fish. In week two, we see the same thing, um, very similar co constituents of the microbiome. I want to point to this orange right here, this Leliatia. This is a bacteria you do not see in the aquatic system, ever. Um, and when we switched to bioorgan uh, food, the Artemia started blowing up with this Leliatia, and it was becoming a monoculture in their, in their microbiome. And again, we've never seen that in fish. Uh, it, it's a, it's a soil-associated bacteria. And in our zooplankton, they basically had a plesiomonas bacteria that dominated their microbiome. Plesiomonas is a bacteria we commonly see in fish in, in, in the wild. Um, now, something occurred at, uh, at week four, um, and what we found was the zooplankton and three of our tanks continue to have this domination of this plesiomonas bacteria, which is not good. You, don't, you do not want a monoculture uh, gut microbiome. Um, but at least this is a natural bacteria. And in one tank of Artemia, it monocultured to this unnatural microbiome. However, I got a call or text from Ben one day, he's like, someone wrong. I was like, well, we're wrong. I was like, well, two of our tanks started showing the plesiomonas or Artemia tanks. And I said, well, we've never seen those in that tank. How did that happen? Um, he's like, I'm really careful. I clean the tanks and we have this you know, water reciprocating system. And so I said, well, let's try to explain this. So we backtracked and we went to the water samples and we never detected plesiomonas in any of our Artemia tanks until, until this week before sampling. Um, so what we came to the conclusion, we really strongly feel that, um, that, that this was an a, a accidental inoculation of um, and I'll show you the design, but what I want to highlight here is that um, with the accidental inoculation of plesiomonas, in one week, the Leliatia, the unnatural bacteria, was halved. So this plesiomonas was, was, was rat, was taking over and then kicking out that unnatural bacteria, which was really interesting to us. So a fortuitous discovery, which I think we're going to follow up on. So how did that fortuitous, fortuitous discovery happen? Well, this was our random query design. You just randomly put, you know, we don't randomly, if you do a, a mathematical model and put them up and what we noticed was was um, these two tanks uh, that were very close to this uh, this little tank to tank we think there was some sloshing uh, plesiomonas is a biofilm bioform filling bacteria so once it gets there it goes really fast um, so we think this was a quote unquote contamination event but uh, gave us some really interesting findings to follow up on so look at that John I told you I would get through this in no time you guys just saw like 35 slides. Um, so with that, um, what is the role of the microbiome in the fish? There's a lot of things we don't know, and I think it may play a, a bigger role than we understand at this point. Um, we know in other fish studies, now a lot of this is in zebrafish, not natural systems, Aquarius systems, because we control that. Fish are hard to study in the wild, and I've learned a lot from this meeting. Um, this has been a great meeting, so I appreciate all of you being here, and uh, it's, been, it's been really fun last my first fish meeting. I was really nervous to come up here. I'm having fun and kind of honing in here. But what we know from the literature is that we know that um, certain bacteria in the fish microbiome can assist in nutrient metabolism. So um, a, a protease predicting bacteria in carnivores versus cellulose degrading bacteria in, in uh, herbivores. Uh, that's a very common association. Uh, we know that uh, bacteria can modify behavior in zebrafish. They can show modification of the microbiome can increase anxiety in zebrafish. What does fish anxiety look like? Well, it's in exploring new things that are put into the aquarium. Um, so that's pretty interesting. And we see this in humans as well. We know that there is, they can regulate the immune system through direct, direct co uh, communication with immune cells, but also through gen, uh, gene regulation. Um, and think about this in early ontogeny when everything's developing. I think that's a really important, um, important uh, process that's going on, at least in my opinion. We know they can help fend off pathogens um, that uh, that they, they kind of colonize, they don't let other pathogens come in. We know that they can include stress response of an organism, so cortisol response in a stress environment, uh, a, a perturbed microbiome, an animal will not, will not release cortisol in some situations. We know that they can promote growth, um, so uh, we know they, have, they can promote the expression of insulin growth factors, other growth factors during that early ontogeny and throughout their life. And what else can it do? Probably a lot of other things. And if it's not right from the beginning, um, what's the end result look like? I don't know the fish. Um, but it could explain some certain situations you're having later on in, in, in fish that aren't uh, maybe naturally um, raised. So with those acknowledgments, obviously there's a lot of work between the Farrell and Ledet lab groups. Ben, a phenomenal master student, Amanda as well, I mean, just the, the, they were just great for my career, John's career, Tibbs, all the members at Tibbs, our funding sources, the fish, we gotta thank the fish. Um, I gotta thank John, John's been a, um, a friend and a mentor throughout my career, um, thank you John. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions, um, 
if this last slide will come up. We got a new future fish leader and and the dancing, my my dancer. Okay.